All right, I'm recording now, so I'm going to get my screen. Um, here we go again. So a little revision. Six reasons may con why contrast may be required. We're going to go for tumor. Okay, and all these con all these indications or all the pathologies that are on this list are um, as a result of increased blood flow. Okay, so tumour, infection and inflammation, they all have an increased blood flow. The diseases we have an increased blood flow. So if you tag the blood, if you give contrast into the blood, you're going to get, um, you're going to get increased signal, okay? Um, contrast enhanced angiography, we know that's one technique, one of three, maybe four or five techniques now that um, are used to display the blood vessels. Also perfusion, so we know um, that certain um, structures, in this case like a heart, the myocardium um, has a very big blood supply and maybe the pituitary gland has a very big blood supply. So if you inject contrast, it's going to perfuse or it's going to go into that um, pituitary gland or into the myocardium straight away. Okay, so if there is a tumour or if there is something in that myocardium or the pituitary gland, the contrast is not going to go into that. So it's going to be hypo-intense in a tumour relative to the, the surrounding tissue. Okay, does that make sense? So that's, that's a perfusion defect. And we sort of see that in MR, in CT as well. If you're looking for a stroke, you're going to see the contrast go into the brain, but it's going to be delayed getting into the stroke. Okay. And we've discussed post-operative lumbar spines in the spine section. Um, where we have to differentiate the disc versus the scar tissue. Right, so when we're talking about um, the chest, abdomen and pelvis, we're talking about structures that always move. We know in the past we've done five scans, um, five scans. In the past we've done scans of areas like the heart, the MSK, um, and like, sorry, like the brain, the MSK, the spine, where you do five or, five or 10 minute scans and the, and the patient has to stay still. When we're scanning the abdomen, chest, maybe sometimes the pelvis, you can't hold your breath for that long. You can't stop your heart beating for five minutes, for five seconds. So we have to do, we have to get around that and do use techniques that will still get our pictures, but um, we'll, um, we'll, get motion free pictures, okay? So we use cardiac gating, we use respiratory gating, um, and in doing that, we have a technique called a navigator. We can also, which I'll explain, and we also use breath hold, okay? So obviously, we have to reduce the scan time. We can't have a five minute breath hold. We have to reduce the scan time down to about 20 seconds. That way, we ask the patient to hold their breath. Obviously, we're still going to get pulsation if we scan near the heart, but we're going to um, get a still um, picture of the lungs. So when we're doing scans of the heart, um, the lead placement varies. So I'm never going to ask you what's the placement of the leads in the chest, okay, because it varies. Um, having said that, and it varies on the system and on man the manufacture of the magnet. Essentially, what we're doing though is we're getting a voltage difference across the heart. That's what ECG is, okay? So they're getting a voltage difference between this electrode and the black electrode, okay? Or this electrode and the green electrode, okay? And we've got a white electrode up the top that is a ground. So um, a voltage difference. Um, and I'll have to change this, I'm making changes today. I'll have to change this because this, this one at the top doesn't, um, is not going to, to get a voltage across your heart. Um, we must keep the loop small, okay, because we know from our safety that the bigger the loop, the larger the loop, the larger um, the current um, accumulates through the wires and through the chest. And so the more chance we're gonna burn the patient. Okay. Also, when we do our time varying magnetic fields, we're going to set up a current there as well. And that's going to reduce the signal from the ECG. So if we have, a no, we have no current um, and we're not changing the magnetic field, 
then we don't get we won't get an extra signal over those between those two loops okay whereas if we do change the the field we're going to generate a signal here and that's going to detract from the actual heart signal okay and we want to keep a cloth under the wires to reduce heating so just put that put a cloth underneath that those wires that way if they do heat up they're not directly onto the skin okay um, and a stabilizer as well. If we if we move those wires, we're gonna we're gonna generate a signal again. Okay. So a signs of a good trace is a regular PQRST trace that's evenly spaced. Beat, 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 and so on. Okay. We don't want beat, 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 beat. We we the machine can't handle that. Okay, so we want to we want to evenly tray evenly spaced trace, no ectopic beats. Um, the R wave has to be larger than the T wave. Okay, so if you've got a, a T wave is a sign of magnetohemodynamic effect. So the blood that goes through the heart has increased signal. Okay, so that's going to increase the T wave and reduce the R wave. So if the machine triggers or starts the, the sequence off that R wave and the T wave's larger, there's a chance that the machine's going to trigger off that T wave, okay, rather than the R wave. Must have good amplitude, okay, so the R wave must be bigger than all the other waves and the baseline must remain stable, okay. Peripheral gating, um, we, we know that's a pulse oximeter. We know that um, this is fiber optic in MRI, so we can't just use any pulse oximeter. Um, this machine stays out of the room, out of the zone four. It goes in through the y waveguide, okay, and then goes in and attaches to the, to the finger of the patient, okay, with, that's in the room. And then, of course, this is, as I say, this is optical fiber. So there's no metal leads that go into the room. Okay. Ease of use. Um, so just the difference between cardiac gating and pulse gating. Cardiac gating is um, a lot more difficult. The main difference is that cardiac gating is a lot more difficult, um, but it's, it's much more reliable um, and it offers more information. Okay, pulse gating is easier. It's not as reliable because it's not as closely aligned with the heart, doesn't give you as much information. Um, and it's a very basic trace, it, but it might be enough to give you some, to, to um, make you, to let you do what you need to do. Okay. So that's cardiac gating. Now we're going to talk about respiratory gating. Okay. So of course we want to move the, we want to move the um, or, or keep the chest still while we scan. So if we're going to do um, scans of the chest, we can get the patient to stop breathing, okay, for 20 seconds. If we can't do a scan under 20 seconds, excuse me, then we have to do a longer scan and we have to watch the patient's breathing out and in, out and in, okay. Every time they breathe out and there's a plateau there, we can do a scan. And then the patient breathes again. They breathe out and there's a plateau, we'll accept the scan that happens in this area as the, as the patient's breathing out. Everything else we reject. We don't, we don't, this doesn't contribute to the image. Okay. And we know that we can decide in case space we can decide the maximum signal, or the, in this case, the minimum signal. So when the patient's moving most, which is down under this green line, we get minimal signal in our case space. Okay, so it goes, if you remember, it goes to the periphery of the case space. If, the patient, if we want maximum signal in the middle of the case space, this is, we, we collect that while the patient is breathing out and the, the chest is relatively still. Okay. 
I mentioned Navigator. So Navigator is like, it's just like a fish finder if you've been fishing. Um, so what happens is rather than use bellows or any, uh, anything else around the chest, the machine puts in its own little pulses. It'll just give you a pulse in that area here of the diaphragm. So it can tell you a time and amplitude. So again, it can tell you whether the patient's, the position of the patient's diaphragm. Okay, so as the patient's breathing out and breathing in, their diaphragm's moving along this, this marker. Okay, so it's got that by putting in pulses. And again, um, it adjusts, it can um, reject all this information or it can um, just store it on the edges of case space, depending on how the program's set. Okay. Stop me if, I, if, you're going to, if I'm going too fast or you want more information. Equipment, the body coil. So um, we, use, um, we use the volume, the torso array or the body array coil, okay? We don't use the body coil. We use the body array coil, okay? Uh, we know the difference between the body array coil and the body coil inside the machine. Respiratory compensation, so we use the bellows that I've just discussed. We use cardiac gating um, when we're imaging the chest. Or we, we don't have to always use cardiac gating, okay? It depends if, if we're imaging a part of the chest that the heart's not going to move over our image and we can redirect phase away from what we're looking at. We don't, need, we don't need to have cardiac gating because it's only going to lengthen the time of the scan. However, if we're scanning the chest um, near the heart, then we'll use cardiac gating. Okay. Of course, we use earplugs and headphones. So patient supine, we know the patient must be comfortable. Um, we acquire mainly in coronal and axial planes. Um, we like to do breath hold when imaging the chest. We prefer breath hold. Most of the sequences now can be acquired in a short time. Um, again, cardiac gating, saturation pulses. So we can put pulses over the heart or over regions of the chest that we can't stop moving. And then we don't get a signal from that region. Okay. Gradient moment nulling, flow compensation. And of course we use, um, so we can reduce the, um, the effect that flowing um, vessels or flowing particles in the um, body, we can reduce the effect that that will have on the image. And of course we, look, we prefer breath hold techniques. So we know the difference between gradient echo and spin echo. So we know that gradient echo, um, gives us shorter scan times in general, um, which means that um, most of the time we don't need to respiratory gate, but um, uh, yep, cardiac gating is not always required. Spin echo requires longer scan times, so, quite, so most of the time we need to respiratory gate, okay? And when we do respiratory gating, we in, that increases the scan time further. If we're just accepting this little part of the respiratory cycle and we're rejecting all this, then we have to scan for a lot longer during the gating. So as we accept all of these, the breathing cycle. Okay. Um, we like the short axis, and we know that that's going to give us the faster scan time, but we also know that that's going to give us pulsation artifact um, over some part of the chest. So we try and redirect that if needed. Um, and we can change the phase encoding direction as required. A couple of techniques to help the patient if they've got a breath hold is oxygen may be given. So we can give them oxygen and that that means they, can, they usually can hold their breath for a little longer. 
Um, we can get them to breathe in and breathe out and breathe in and out and then hold their breath rather than just breathe in, out and hold their breath. Um, and we want to, we generally want to have a slow heart rate when we're scanning, um, when we're scanning the heart. Okay. So cardiac gating, I'm just going to go through a couple of positions. So that's our orthogonal axial. So if we put the patient in the machine and we just did a standard axial scan to the chest, we'd end up with this picture. Okay. We'd, we'd align the slices of the image and we get what's called a two chamber view. Okay, so the two chamber is, in, in this case, it's the left two chamber. So in this case, we've got the left atrium and the left ventricle. Okay, and we'd see this as a cine um, image. And I was just looking up, I can show you some cine images in a minute. Okay, so then we start to, we, once we get this orthogonal view, we start to um, tailor the scans to the position of the heart in the patient. Okay, we can't just put the patient in and immediately get a two chamber view. We must position the patient. Uh, we must position the slices according to the patient. So then we get a four chamber view. Okay, so obviously you can see the left, see the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left ventricle and the left atrium. Okay, and again, I've got a couple of cine images off the internet that will show you the motion of the heart um, in a cine. We have a four chain, we have a short axis view. So what we can do is if we take a scan or a slice across the short axis of the two chamber, okay, and across the short axis of the four chamber, we'll end up with an axial slice of the heart. Okay, so one slice that goes across there and is also positioned here, we'll end up with an axial view of the heart. Okay, so you can see there we've got the right side and we've got the left side, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the left ventricle of the heart. Okay, and you've got a little a diagram there to show you the muscles and the myocardium. Now we've got the left out ventricular outflow tract. So the anatomy here is the left atrium, the left ventricle, and the aorta. Okay, so what you'll be able to see in a minute is a cine image where the, the blood flows in one complete cycle, um, heart cycle, the blood will flow from the atrium to the ventricle and then be ejected out of the aorta. Okay. So they're the, they're the scans that, um, they're the common planes that we use in cardiac imaging. The left two chamber, the four chamber, the short axis, and the left ventricular outflow tract. So you may need to know those for the test the planes, but you won't need to know how they're positioned. Okay, but you, you should know, you should um, just be able to, to not even identify, well, yeah, go on. you should be able to identify them. Okay, and, and certainly name them. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to share the screen with you. So this the two chamber and the four chamber trying to be in the same line. This can you see this is a two chamber view, this one on the left, by our left. Okay, so that so we've got the we've got the atrium and we've got the ventricle and they're pumping together, okay, in a cine, or they're pumping in the cine 
and it, it shows you in one complete cycle and then it loops over that cycle. Okay, we'll just watch it one more time and we can see that cycle. Okay, so that's a two chamber view. This is an outflow tract, so a left ventricular outflow tract. Okay, so we can see the left atrium, the left ventricle, and the blood being ejected through the aortic valves and up through the anterior, through the ascending aorta. Okay, so that's the that's an a left ventricular outflow tract or LVOT view, and you can see the leaflets quite nicely as well. Okay, get rid of those, and then I found a four vent four chamber view. So. We've got the atrium, the left atrium, the left ventricle, the right ventricle and the right atrium, and we've got the leaflets there. Okay, so once we get a, once we get a standard view for that, we can do cine imaging of the heart in those um, planes. Okay, um, now, stop. Share. Um, screen share, start share, go. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted that one. No, yes. There we are. Okay. So that's the heart imaging. That's basic, very basic imaging of the heart using MRI. Now we're going to move on to imaging the breast. So we use a breast coil. We use cushions, pillow stabilizers, extension tubing, because we're going to give IV contrast. And we like to use an automatic injector. So as we know exactly the rate of which, at which we're injecting the blood, the, the contrast into the blood. Okay. So most, place, most places we'll always use an automatic injector so they can set the rate exactly like CT, I guess. You can see where the patient's prone, head first. They must use a breast coil, okay, and they must be comfortable. Um, with the sequences of the breast that we use to identify, to scan the breast, um, we, we do the same thing that we would do in other areas. So we have a T1, we have a T2 fat set, and we have contrast. T1 fat set after contrast in different planes. Okay, so we're looking mainly for tumour in infection. So we'll have T1 scans, we'll have T2 fat set weighted scans, and we'll have um, post contrast T1 weighted scans. Okay, and that's pretty standard um, when we're looking for tumour and infection because we're usually looking for lumps in the breast. So the T1 in this case is a T1 gradient scan. We usually scan in axial and sagittal planes, okay? We generally don't scan um, coronal, okay? Um, we do T2 fat set, axial and, and sagittal. Then we do T1 pre-contrast because we always do a pre-contrast exactly the same as a post-contrast, okay? So remember, the post-contrast now is going to be a dynamic scan. So we're going to require it very, very quickly because we want to see the blood going through the breast tissue into or around a possible lesion, okay? So if we did a scan that takes five minutes, we're not gonna see the passage of blood going through that lesion. If we did a scan every 30 seconds, a very quick scan every 30 seconds, we're going to, take, we're going to see the uptake of contrast in that lesion over time, okay? So of course we want, whenever we do a post-contrast, we want a pre-contrast to compare it, okay? Um, I'm going to jump that slide and we're going to do this slide first. So what's the difference between a malignant and a benign um, tumour in the breast or, or lesion in the breast? Okay. 
Nearly always, a malignant tumor will have a fast uptake of contrast. Okay, so we're going to do a scan at zero, one, two, three minutes after injection. That contrast is going to go straight to that malignant tumor, and then it's going to stay bright and well. In this case, slowly get slowly get darker. Okay, but it's going to have a very quick uptake of the contrast. The T2 star weighted um, scan um, and a T2 star weighted first pass scan, it's going to that, that contrast is actually, this is the time where that contrast um, affects T2 weighting. So if we do gradient echo, that contrast is going to dephase the signal. So it's going to make the T2 scans darker quicker. Okay. So don't stress, I don't think you need to stress too much about that. What I want you to stress about and learn is that a contrast scan on a T1 weighted image of the breast, a tumour, um, a malignant tumour, will take up the contrast much faster than a benign tumour. Okay. Here we have a fibroadenoma, which is benign. And we can see that that contrast, it still up, up takes the contrast, takes up the contrast, but it's much slower. Okay, so that's at about five minutes, it becomes bright. Whereas here, the contrast becomes in, in under a minute. Okay, even 30 seconds. So the, so the contrast is, is um, is taken up much slower in a benign tumour than an aggressive malignant tumour, okay? Which makes sense because a malignant tumour will have a collection of blood vessels. It will make its own blood vessels and it will be, um, uh, it, it will uptake the blood and use that blood a lot more efficiently than a benign tumour. There's just the tissue, there's a, there's a um, a argument for doing breast imaging um, according to the menstrual cycle. Okay, so we can see in week four that breast tissue is a lot thicker, okay, and a lot denser. So if there is a lesion in there, you won't be able to see it as well as if you did a scan in the first week um, after the menstrual cycle, after the period. Okay, so um, there is a good, that's a good indication that um, we like to time the scans so as we do it shortly after the period, okay, or, time, or just time it according to the menstrual cycle because we want to reduce that, that heavy tissue, okay, the fibrous tissue. The other reason, the other reason we, get, we do scans of the breast is for rupture of breast implants. Okay, so we know that breast implants are mostly, not always, but mostly made of silicon. Okay, so what we want to do, if we've got a patient with a breast implant and we, we're looking for the rupture, we don't want to null the signal from silicon because then we're not going to see the rupture. We want to null the signal from the rest of the breast tissue. That way we see, um, the, the silicon is, remains bright and we see the silicon um, or any leakage around the implant. Okay, so in which case, exactly the same as what we've discussed um, with the fat saturation. So if we, if, we rem, if we remember chemical fat saturation, we have no silicon in the, in the spine, maybe. We just have a, a water, and a fat peak, okay, normally. And then if we put a, put a pulse over the fat peak and null that signal from fat during chemical pre-saturation, we're just left with a water peak, okay? As soon as we have, in this case, a breast implant, we have a silicon peak, okay? So if we can put a saturation pulse over the fat, and the water peak, okay, at the, the protons that are spinning at this frequency, these two frequencies, then we can just see the silicon peak. 
Okay. So in this case, we've got what's called an extra capsular rupture, where the, the silicon, the fat and the water have been nulled, as I just said. The silicon has come through the, the fibrous capsule and it's leaking into the breast. There's also a leak, there's also an inner capsule in this breast implant, okay, or in most breast implants. If there's a leak in the inner capsule, you get what's called a linguine sign, linguine pasta. Okay, so you get like a, a loop of linguine or pasta inside the inside the um, breast implant. Okay, so there's two types of rupture. There's extra capsular where the silicon leaks into the breast, and there's the linguine sign where the internal um, or the inner capsule ruptures, and you get um, silicon in between the two layers. So you can see that layer, the inner layer of the, the breast implant. And there it is again, okay, with the silicon outside. So we don't want to null the signal from silicon. We want to null the signal from fat and um, water around the silicon. And that makes the silicon more conspicuous. Okay, so we've done the breast implants. Now we're going to get on to the brachial plexus. So the brachial plexus, we're going to, we're going to image um, with a spine coil, cushion pillows and stabilizers, um, and imaging plane. What we like to do is we like to image along the brachial plexus. So we see the brachial plexus in the length of the brachial plexus. We know it come out from between C5 and T1. So if we can image along the plane of that brachial plexus, we're going to see it in its length, okay? And exactly the same technique um, as we've discussed. We want to do T1 imaging and we want to do T2 imaging, okay? Um, the plane coronal and axial um, are very good, okay? Um, yeah, I'll discuss that. The coronal and the axial planes are very good. We might change that to and or axial. So it just depends again on the department's protocol. Okay, I'm not really fussed um, how you explain what, whether you do a coronal or an axial or what you want to do. I just, I'm more, more, um, I'm more concerned that you know the weighting. So um, T2, fast spin echo, or you could have T2 with fat sat, with or without fat saturation. Okay. Um, it doesn't matter. I'm not concerned whether you use fat saturation or not, as long as you understand why you would use it, okay? Um, obviously, in this case, T2 is going to give a signal that, a fat signal that's bright, okay? Fast spin echo, and with use fat sat, um, you're going to null that signal from fat, which means only the water signal in the T2 will be bright. We know that any disease in the brachial plexus, the water signal is going, the edema is going to, um, or the body is going to use edema um, at that area of any lesion or any pathology. Okay, so on a T2 fat sat or non fat sat sequence, it's going to be bright. Any pathology is going to be bright. Okay, and then of course T1 spin echo, you're going to use that um, to see vascular um, or to see, sorry, no, you're going to see T1 to see anatomy, okay, the anatomy around a lesion or the anatomy because there's no lesion. Um, or you'll go and you, then you're going to do a contrast scan, you're going to do the T1 after contrast. We're going to use fat sat exactly the same as when we use it for musculoskeletal because we're going to want to null the signal from fat. 
So any vascular lesion or any signal from the contrast will be bright and any signal from the fat will be dark. Okay, so a T2 um, weighted scan with or without fat sat and a T1 weighted scan um, without fat sat and then um, post scan a T1 weighted scan with fat sat are the weightings that we would use for um, pathology. Hopefully we, we're getting the, hopefully we're getting the gist of, of, of those weightings. So there's some images of a, of a brachial plexus, a coronal scan of the brachial plexus. Okay, we've angled along, you don't need to know the angle, but we've angled along those nerves to see those nerves in their length which shows us more information along the length of those nerves rather than if we just did an angle that we saw proximal nerves, middle nerves on the next slice and distal nerves on the last slice. We would prefer to have a slice that covers the whole length of those nerves, exactly like the ACL and the supraspinatus imaging. Okay. Um, we've, we've seen a pathology involving the seventh nerve Okay, so that's, um, that's a scan that's angled along the nerve. A T2 weighted fat sat, nerve, fat sat scan. So this is fluid. Okay. And then um, this highlights the other important thing that I haven't, um, I didn't explain in the first slide. We always, when we do brachial plexus imaging, we always do a scan of the cervical spine, a normal scan of the cervical spine, okay? Because as we know, any lesions along the length of these nerves and blood vessels um, can mimic, or, or any pathology along there can mimic pathology that may be in the cervical spine because all these nerves travel through the cervical spine. Okay, so if there's compression up here, if there's compression down there, it may give the same symptoms. So we always do a cervical spine protocol. Okay, and in this case, we've done our myelopathy scans and our radiculopathy scans, and we've seen compression in the neural exit foramina as, it, as the nerves exit the cord. There's another scan where there's a lesion further down the, the um, brachial plexus. Okay, so the abdomen. We're talking about, we don't do in CT, we generally, uh, well, I haven't done CT for a long time, so what do I know? But CT generally do, as far as I'm aware, do a chest abdo pelvis and they do the, the, the whole thing in one run. Okay, MRI generally don't do that. MRI, we target our organs. Okay, so we'll do a liver scan or we'll do um, a, a scan MRCP of the, of the bile ducts or we'll do a scan of the pancreas, the kidneys or per, perhaps an enterogram. Okay, so we'll, we'll just briefly touch on those. The liver. Um, we use the body coil um, or the, the body array coil. God, I'm bad at that. Okay, we don't use the body coil. We use the body array coil. We also use the spine coil if um, the back of the body is not covered. It depends on the maker of the machine and the type of body array coil you're using. We always put a cannula in because we always give contrast for a liver. And we always, um, well, we generally breath hold the patient and do some scans using the gating, as we discussed earlier. We like to do supine, head or feet first, and make the patient comfortable. Um, generally, we scan with axials. Sometimes we use coronals, but most of the time, with the liver and with the abdominal imaging, we do axial scans, okay? Very, very, very rarely will we do sagittal scans of the abdomen. Exactly the same thing, okay? So we do T2 weighted images of the liver. We do T1 
weighted images of the liver. Okay, in this case, we might use a gradient or a three-dimensional gradient sequence. We also do what's called an in and out of phase axial. So that identifies fat and water lesions depending on their phase. I'm not gonna go into that, but um, I would like you to know, you could do a little bit of reading and know the difference between in and out of phase axial imaging or just imaging of the liver, okay? It's just, it's a way of identifying fat and water in the lesion, that in a lesion that's in the liver. Okay, and we do that through other abdominal structures as well. Okay, we also do a diffusion weighted imaging. Okay, so um, we know that diffusion weighted imaging is very good for strokes in the brain. It's also very good to, di to differentiate between metastases and or, or benign versus malignant metastases. Okay, or, 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 or cancers, I should say. Benign versus malignant tumours. Okay, so diffusion-weighted imaging is very good for differentiating between benign and malignant tumours. In the brain, in the abdomen, everywhere in the body. Okay. Um, of course, we give contrast, so, and we're going to do a dynamic scan through the liver. Exactly the same as CT, in that we do... Um, one scan every minute, maybe, okay. We do T1 weighted imaging. We may or we may not use FATSAT. It depends on you, depends on what you like. And then we do a semi-delayed scan. And then we do um, a longer delayed image, okay. So as far as your test goes, I'm happy if you just know that we do dynamic scanning of the liver after contrast, okay? So dynamic scanning, meaning zero, one, two, three, or five minutes, or and five minutes. So we see the uptake of the contrast in the lesion, okay? Um, that's the most important thing. So in and out of phase axials to identify fat and water in the liver, T1 dynamic pre, because we always do dynamic pre if we're going to do dynamic post for comparison. A series of T2 weighted axial images, plus or minus fat set, I don't mind. And diffusion weighted images to differentiate the type of cancer, um, the type of tumour, whether it's benign or malignant. Does that make sense to everyone? So uh, a type of tumour is a hepatocellular carcinoma caused by repeated cycles of necrosis and regeneration. So the cells die, then they're regenerated. The cells die, they regenerate. We know that when that happens, they can start to have mutagens when they, or mutate when they regenerate. Okay. Um, most common cirrhosis of the liver causes this regeneration. Hep hepatitis B and C, is also um, a predisposition to cancerous mute, um, mutations. Um, it's a common uh, malignancy in the liver, or it's, it's the commonest malignancy if you have a, one in the liver. Um, and if, if it metastasizes, you have a poor prognosis. Okay, so T1 hypo intense, T2 hyper intense, and it is. Um, enhanced in the arterial phase, which makes sense because it's a malignant tumour um, and it's, um, it, it's going to have a, a good organisation or a, a, um, a good way of getting blood vessels to help it grow. Okay, exactly like the breast. So we're going to use, um, it's going to uptake the contrast quickly. We use a uh, contrast that's specifically designed to go into hepatocytes or liver cells um, rather than just the normal contrast, okay? So there's, it's called EOVIST or PRIMAVIST and it's designed to, to be uptaken in the liver cells in the body. An MRCP, 
Okay, so that's gonna that's like an ERCP or a C uh, um, a, a CT cholangiogram, and it's have it's imaging requirements within the liver, um, and it's heavily weighted T2 of the bile duct. So by heavily weighted T2, we know that T2 weighting relies primarily on TE, a longer TE, the longer the T2 weighting. So we usually use about 100. This image would have been acquired with about seven or 800. Okay, so the bright bile, or the bile is very, very bright. The background is very, very dark because that would have defaced. Okay, so you've got very, very bright bile to show the ducts and you've got a dark background and you've got a stone in that bile duct, okay? And that stone is stopping all this bile, so we've got dilated bile ducts. Kidneys, um, plus or minus ureters and bladders, exactly the same um, type of weighting as the liver, okay? The same coil, the same position, the same type of sequences for the same reasons. The only difference might be if you want to see the, the ureters, then you have to do heavily weighted T2 images, okay? Exactly the same as the MRCP. The longer the TE, the brighter the water, and the darker the background. So if you want to see the ureters, you do exactly the same thing, and you're going to enhance the water in the ureters, or the, the um, urine in the ureters. An angiogram is um, an examination of the um, small intestines. Okay, so you can see there that we we're doing we've given the con the patient contrast a barium solution, and that um, we've given them a lot of contrast, and that's dilated the small bowel. Okay, so if we pushed out dilated the small bowel we can see if there's any lesions that are apple core lesions in the bowel or inflammation of the bowel walls. Okay. So a barium meal or equivalent, um, we can get them to drink the contrast or we can put it in a nasojejunal, put it straight into their small intestine. We also use buscopan. So buscopan decreases bowel motion. You might have, you might use that in CT, I'm not sure, or other imaging. So it decreases bowel motion. Okay, that means the bowel stays still. That means we can get better pictures. Coronal and axials. We do um, Corradian Echo T2s to show that contrast. Okay, we also do gradients to very quick scans, like three or four second scans, and then every three or four second scans, we might do a scan, and that shows the motion of the bowel wall. Okay, so if you do 10 quick scans and all of the bowel wall moves in peristalsis, there's and there's part of the bowel wall that doesn't move, then we know that bowel, bowel wall. Um, is static, okay, and it doesn't have that muscular, it's diseased, okay. And of course, we would do that type of scanning before buscopan, otherwise, the whole of the bowel will be static, okay. So, if we do 10 quick scans, and the bowel is going to be in slightly different motion, different position, okay, whereas if the bowel's infarcted or dead it will, or ischemic, it will be in the same position. So we won't see it moving between those 10 scans. Coronal and axials are the most informative again. And again, you can do a, a selection of T2s, T1s if you want to, or T1s pre-contrast, and then we do dynamic post-contrast to show the blood supply within the bowel wall. Okay, didn't realize this lecture was so long. Um, we're nearly finished. We're just getting to the pelvis now. Three clinical indications for the pelvis, a cancer of the rectum, 
cancer of the cervix and cancer of the prostate or, or hyperplasia versus cancer of the prostate. So the rectum, um, we have buscopan to decrease bowel motion, okay, of the rectum and of the, of the motion of, of um, bowel around the rectum. Um, again, we do T, a, a T1 um, in a couple of planes. T2 weighted scans are most informative. Um, I'm not, you, you don't need to know that you can just, for ease, you can just say that T1, a selection of T1 and T2s. Again, we do diffusion weighted imaging. Um, and we also give contrast and do dynamic scans. Um, and contrasts um, in the axial T1, spin echo, fat sat, axial, sagittal, and coronal scans. Okay. The most important thing for the for the um, the rectum and the cervix, in this case we, we're scanning the cervix, is that you get it perpendicular, you get the scans planes perpendicular to the lesion. Okay, so if you're doing axials, you must scan exactly perpendicular to the rectum um, on the, in the axial plane, that's axial AP and left to right, in order to get, um, that way, if this is the rectum, if you scan perpendicular to the rectum, you can, um, measure whether that tumour has invaded into the rectum and or outside of the rectum. If you scan at an angle, it's not so obvious. Okay, so you must scan directly um, perpendicular to the rectum in all planes in order to see whether the tumour has invaded the wall or invaded outside or invaded other tissues around it. Okay, that's very important for staging. So um, I think I've got, um, there's, a, there's a grade three tumor invasion to mesorectal fat. Okay, the fat around the rectum. There's the different stages. Okay. This is probably most informative. So it's not visible in stage zero. Stage 1A, stage B, um, tumour is visible. Disruption of low in signal, signal intensity vaginal wall, okay, of the cervix. And then invasion of lower one third of the vagina or lower of um, signal in the bladder or rectal wall is stage four. Okay, so the different stages, depending on um, the, the extension of the tumour in and around the cervix and um, the rectum. Okay, so we can see a couple of scans there, invasion into the rectum from the cervix. Okay, so we're looking at the cervical carcinoma, invasion into the bladder, of course, we scan with a, with a full bladder then. Invasion into the bladder, invasion into the rectum. Okay, and then that would be a different grade. So that would be a grade four. Lastly, but not least, the prostate. Evaluation of extension in and around the prostate glands. Okay, again, um, must be perpendicular to the plane of the prostate to stage disease, that's most important. T1 and T2 scans of the prostate, and then we give contrast. We have, um, and this shows us different, different um, uh, images, images of the of, um, tumour within the um, uh, a T2 hypo-intense signal within normal hyper-intense peripheral zone. So what this is saying is there's a hypo-intense signal within the normal um, hyper-intense peripheral zone. 
Okay, so this is normally hyper intense and there's a hypo intense signal here. Okay, and then that's going to be enhanced or this signal you can see is enhanced over here. Okay. All right, two minutes late. Is there any questions? Is there anyone still here? Any questions, anything 